Um, so anyway, today we're going we're gonna to continue on in this series that we've been in for the last few weeks on the book of Acts. Uh, it's called Unleashed. And uh, we've been talking over the last few weeks about some of the things that happened when the Holy Spirit first came and lived in these first believers, these first followers of Jesus. And, and the Spirit comes and lives in us in the same way. And, and we've been talking about this, this same power that raised Jesus from the grave, living in us. The same God who spoke everything that we see into being. And yet, we know that at times, we, we often just ignore the Spirit's presence and power in our life. We take it for granted. And so our prayer for this series is that, is that God would, uh, would help us to walk in a fuller awareness of the Spirit's presence and power in us, and that we would allow the Spirit to uh, more fully unleash His power through us on this campus and in this town. So today we're going to be picking it up at the end of Acts chapter 2, uh, and we're going to see the Spirit sort of unleashed in, in the community of faith, in the church. Um, so let me pray for us, and we'll, we'll jump right in. Father, we, we thank you for the chance for us to be together. Lord, it is no small thing. The things that we do in this room, the things that we do throughout the week as a part of this church, they are not small things, and we thank you for them, Lord. We thank you for the blessing. Spirit, we ask that today you would just, you would speak. You would fill us up with this good news, and that we would walk in obedience with you in light of that good news. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, so we're going to pick it up in Acts chapter 2, starting in verse 42, and it'll be up on the screen. It says, And they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and the fellowship, to the breaking of bread and the prayers. And awe came upon every soul, and many signs and wonders were being done through the apostles. And all who believed were together and had all things in common. And they were selling their possessions and belongings and distributing the proceeds to all as any had need. And day by day, attending the temple together, breaking the bread in their homes, they received their food with glad and generous hearts, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to their number day by day those who were being saved. So that's it for today, just six verses. Just keep, keep it simple. But man, what... A section, right? What a bunch of six verses right here. Uh, I know many of you have probably interacted with these verses many times, whether you've read them or you've heard them, uh, heard them read before, but um, it is freshly stunning when we see this early community, this early body of Christ. I, I don't know about you guys, but my, my heart starts to beat a little faster when I see these people and what they had. And the reason for that is that this is the kind of family that we long to be a part of, right? We get excited to see this. We say, man, these people had something. They had some awesome experiences. Since the very beginning, there are, have been two fundamental longings inside of each and every one of us. And this is something that Keith talked a little bit about uh, this weekend at the retreat. These two fundamental longings, this longing to be deeply connected with God and this longing to be deeply connected with other people, right? We, we see this, and, and Adam and Eve had this perfectly in the garden, right? We see Adam walking with God. We see Adam talking with God. He knew God. He is deeply connected with God. And then Eve comes on the scene, right? God says, it's not good for Adam to do this thing by himself. He needs someone like him, and so I'm going to create Eve. Um, look with me at Genesis chapter 2, verse, starting in verse 21. It says, So the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon the man, and while he slept, God took one of his ribs and closed up its place with flesh. And the rib that the Lord God had taken from the man, he made into a woman and brought her to the man. And the man said, this at last is bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife, the two, and they shall become one flesh. And the man and his wife were both naked and not ashamed. Now, I put this up here sort of as a, uh, in, in the way that it's written in the scriptures because when Adam sees Eve... He literally starts singing. You see how it's sort of like in poetry here. He literally starts singing. He says, at last, at last, I have this person who is like me, who I can share life with. 
And so Adam and Eve have these two fundamental longings satisfied from the very beginning, right? But we know that the story takes a turn. We know that that is not our experience now, right? We know what happens. We rebelled against God. That harmony, that connection is shattered. And ever since then, we've been searching everywhere for the thing that will satisfy these two longings, right? We look for it everywhere. But no matter where we turn, we can't find it. We can't find anything, and we don't see any hope that one day we might find it, right? Um, when I was in high school, I got a chance to go uh, backpacking out in Colorado with some of my friends uh, uh, from our church, and I was really excited. We, we didn't really know that much about backpacking, to be honest with you, but we thought, hey, we're walking around in the woods with stuff on our backs. How hard can it be, right? Um, and uh, so, so we, we head out there, and uh, and we started the first morning on this trail. We were, we were making a loop in Rocky Mountain National Park. And, uh, and as we started, it started to rain just a little bit, just really more of a mist. And we're like, man, this feels really nice. Like, we got this heavy pack on. It's like 70 degrees. This feels super nice. We probably don't need to, like, put our jackets on or cover up our backpacks, right? And that was mistake number one in the line of many mistakes that week. Um, so we, we start walking up the mountain, and uh, I was kind of hanging out with a couple of different guys who were sort of on my uh, pace level uh, in, in hiking. And so we're having a great time. We're, we're really enjoying things. Um, and then we, we get to the tree line. And, and at the tree line, that's the place where the trees stop growing because they don't have enough oxygen to grow above that level. It's a this certain elevation. And we get to the tree line, and the thing that happened at the tree line is that the bottom just fell out of the temperature. I'm talking it dropped like 30 degrees. And so all of a sudden, that, that uh, nice, cool rain that we were enjoying became a bit of an issue. Uh, so we're frantically sort of scrambling to get our, our, our stuff covered up, to get our jackets on, uh, all of that, but the damage was done. We were soaked, and our stuff was soaked. And so we keep going on, and as it's raining, there's this very thick cloud of, of fog around us. And so we can only see about 50 feet in any direction, which was super disappointing because, you know, we were like, man, we're going to be able to see some awesome stuff while we're out here. And we're seeing just fog, which you can see anyway, right? Um, and so, so we're, we're walking, and we can really only see just sort of the path in front of us. And, and as we walk, the lack of oxygen starts to take its toll on us because there's, there's less oxygen up at that elevation. Uh, we're, we're soaking wet, we're freezing, and then we start to get a little hungry. We had planned on stopping for lunch, but uh, we just kept saying, oh, we'll, we'll keep going a little bit till this weather breaks, we'll keep going till we get to a spot where we're all together, on and on. And so immediately this place, this, this trip, which was, we were so excited about, has become honestly the most physically miserable day of my entire life. I, I could say that, no, no qualifications. It was miserable. Um, we, we met a park ranger as he was coming down the mountain, and he said, guys, you need to be really careful today. Uh, with these conditions, it's a great day to get hypothermia. We're like, awesome. This is awesome. This trip is the best. Um, and, and so we're tired, we're hungry, we're cold. And we have no idea how much further we have to go. I mean, it was a desperate situation, honestly. And so my friend, he stops us and he says, guys, we got to stop. I have got to have something to eat before we go any further. Does anybody have any, anything packed in the top of their, uh, of their packs? And that was mistake number two. We, we packed all our stuff right in the bottom of the pack, obviously, because that's where it should be. Uh, and so we have no food accessible to us. We were looking through all the pockets of the backpack thinking, oh, maybe we stuffed one in there. And, and, and so I, I opened my pack and I couldn't take everything out because everything would get more wet. But I'm sort of just digging around down in it and I'm moving around and my hand strikes gold. And I pull it out and it's a Snickers. Snickers satisfies, right? We tear the, the label off that thing, and, and we split it up three ways. So, I mean, you know, it's like two bites of a Snickers we're getting. But I can honestly tell you, 
of all the wonderful meals I've eaten in my entire life. There is nothing, there's never been anything that has tasted as good to me as that Snickers bar, and I will remember it uh, till the day I die. So good. Um, I, I, do, I think they need to get me for the commercials, I'll be honest. So if you guys know anybody, let them know, I'm the guy. Um, but, you know, that, that Snickers bar honestly was like manna from heaven. I mean, that sounds like an exaggeration, I, we had to have that thing, and it completely changed our day. We sat down, we ate our two bites of Snickers, and we started to be like, huh, maybe we can do this. Maybe we can make it. We, can, we have no idea how much further we have to go, but maybe we can keep going. We had these two bites of Snickers. It was this hope out of a place that was completely hopeless, right? Right? When we come to this passage in Acts, it's like that. It's like that Snickers bar. We've looked everywhere for the thing that we see happening here in this section. And we say, wow, I've not seen that anywhere else. These people had the thing that I was looking for. They had it right there, and and they didn't have to wait until God came back and finished all his recreation work here on on, on earth. They had it right there in their normal lives. It's this beacon of hope for us. And it's no coincidence that uh, the Spirit comes, and we don't see any of this type of community before then. The Spirit comes, and immediately the next thing is this, this amazing community. God comes and God satisfies. So let's look a little bit more closely at some of the things that, uh, that these people were doing. Uh, I think as we do that, what we're going to realize is uh, they weren't really crazy things. They weren't like super spiritual. They weren't, you know, doing anything kind of really out of the ordinary. They were doing pretty simple things. And what that shows us is that the Lord was the one that made this community what it was. Let's just look at it really quickly. So this was a group of people who shared life together every day, right? This was a group of people who every single area of their life, they did it together. Um, They ate together. They went about their normal routine together. They sought the Lord together, right? We see them uh, listening to the apostles' teaching, praying, praising God, going to the temple together. They're seeking the Lord together, and then as they're praying, the Lord is answering their prayers, right? As we pray, we know that it lines us up with what God would have for us, and that was happening for them. They're praying, and in the weeks ahead, we're going to see God do some really crazy things in and around these people. Uh, We're going to see Peter and uh, and John heal a bunch of people. We're going to see the believers praying because Peter and John are in jail, And as they're praying, there's going to be an angel come and set them free, right? That will build your faith. If you start praying that someone will just, you know, be released from prison, and then they they are, that'll build your faith a little bit. Um, We're going to see a couple people who uh, actually drop dead, uh, which I'll let David sort of handle that. We'll buckle up for that in a few weeks. But um, God is moving very clearly and very powerfully in their midst, And their faith is continuing to grow. And that is something that excites us, right? And then we get to verse 44. They had all things in common. They they are bearing one another's burdens. They're celebrating together. They're mourning together. They're challenging and encouraging one another. And they're selling all their possessions so that people who don't have food can have some food. Now, um, that's kind of crazy, right? Poverty didn't exist in this community. Now, that's not to say that, uh, that it was always like this, but at this point in time, there was no poverty. God was using these people to meet the needs of the community. Not only that, but this was a community where regardless of the things that divided them before, they were together. No one was left out. And this is crazy because, and it's easy for us to sort of pass over this, but in Acts chapter 2, at the very beginning, we see the Spirit come. They start speaking uh, in all these different languages, telling the good news about Jesus to all these people. And, uh, and what happens, it, it says that there among them, there were people from every nation under the sun. There's people come from all over the place, and it lists a bunch of those uh, nations. And, and so they're there, and 
they are all Jews. They're all in Jerusalem to celebrate this Jewish festival. But beyond that, they have really not much common ground, right? These are people from, that have had very different life experiences. They're people who have, uh, have come from different places, speak different languages. These are people who have different political affiliations, different theological opinions. The things that typically divide people, we see not dividing this community, right? Uh, likely in, in the midst here, we probably had some Pharisees and some Sadducees, right? You guys remember that from the Gospels, these two groups of uh, religious leaders. These people clashed. They didn't hang out. They weren't friends. And, and here they are breaking bread together. We know that there were people there from Rome, people who had come from all the way to Jerusalem from Rome. And likely there were some that supported uh, Roman rule in Israel, we also know that there were some people called, uh, this group of people called the Zealots. One of Jesus' disciples, Simon the Zealot, was a part of this group. And the Zealots were essentially uh, a group of terrorists who would try to do these things to uh, destabilize the Roman government in Israel so that the Jews could rule over themselves, right? And now we have these two groups of people together. They're selling their possessions so that no one has any need. That is crazy, all of these things that normally divide us just fade. And so the good news for us is this. The same type of family is available to us today. The good news for us is that God continues to use his community, his people, to satisfy those two fundamental desires in our hearts. We've seen it right here, right? We've seen people who are very different in our church come together and be best friends, who had nothing in common. We see all kinds of things, needs being met, right? We see this. And we know that it's not perfect. We know that, uh, that there's issues at times, right? We know that at times we, we struggle. And it might seem, as we look at this passage, that that wasn't the case for them. Like, they had everything in common. Everything was great for them. But we're going to see in just a few chapters' time, they had some issues of their own. Uh, There's some tension. We know that it's not perfect, but that doesn't change the fact that God was using this community to satisfy those two fundamental longings in our hearts. There is a chance for us today to still have those two things satisfied in the community of faith. Now, I say a chance because it won't just magically happen, right? We can't just come on Sunday morning and it's all the feels, baby. I'm ready to go. Fill me up, Lord. Um, we see these people devoting themselves to this community. That's the word that they use. They really engage. We have to devote ourselves to doing life together. We have to devote ourselves to doing life with people who we disagree with, who are different from us. We have to devote ourselves to meeting the needs of the people around us. We have to devote ourselves to seeking the Lord with others, right? But if we will, then God will satisfy those longings right here. But there's more to it than that. I got, it says, but wait, there's more. This is exciting. But wait, there's more. Um, it, the good news doesn't stop there for us. Because what we see at the end of this section is that uh, in verse 47, there's this, uh, there's this continued ministry. What happens is, is those people, that community in Jerusalem was turning some heads, right? It says, they had favor with all people and the Lord added to their number day by day those who were being saved. When it talks about they have favor with all people, people in Jerusalem were starting to take note. They were seeing their neighbors, their coworkers, people that they knew, joining in with this community, and it seemed that these people had something, had the thing that they were looking for. And so what happens for us now, in the same way that this passage, when we look at it, it fills us with hope that God can do this here and now, in the same way that it fills us up with hope, now we have become that hope for the world. Do we see this? When the world looks at us, it is filled with the same sort of hope that we see in Acts 2. The hope that people can be 
deeply connected to God and deeply connected to each other. Right here in Blacksburg, you know, we live in a world where people long to, to know the Lord, to be with God, right? They, they often don't know that. They don't know that's the thing that they're searching for, but, but that's the reality. We know that's true. We live in a place where uh, people long to be connected to each other. They look for it everywhere they go. We're looking for community. We look for it in the hobbies that we have. We do that with other people. We look for it as we go looking for for romantic love, right? We look for it as we, we go out to, to bars and all these different things, right? People are searching for this thing. And when they look here, when they see this community, it fills them with hope. Again, we know that it's not perfect, but it fills them with hope. Because they see a group of people who have access to the thing that satisfies their souls. God uses these communities, our communities of faith, to demonstrate to the world what he's offering. People look at this body and they say, you know what, uh, there's, there's Democrats, there's Republicans, there's independents, and they're all in here together, right? There's people of various races in a time in our, when we're very racially divided in this country, And it speaks a strong word that those are not the things that are most important to us in this family. What is most important to us is loving God and loving each other, right? That speaks a pretty strong word in this day and age. So we know that when we devote ourselves to engaging in the community of faith, that God will satisfy us. We can be sure of that. But he's going to take that community that he builds and he's going to use it to reveal himself to the world. So what we do here, what we do in this family, has monumental consequences, both for us and for the people in our lives who don't know the Lord, who aren't a part of this community. They see us and they see that God satisfies, right? So as we finish up this morning... We have to ask ourselves, in light of this good news, in light of uh, this, this truth about God using this community to satisfy the desires of our hearts, what do we do? What does it mean for us? It's a nice truth, maybe, you know, it makes us feel good, but, but what does it mean? How do we live in light of it? There are probably some of you in here who would say, uh, I'm, I'm not really a part of God's family right now. I, I've never asked God to adopt me as a son or a daughter, and that's okay. The question for you today is, do you want to be? Because that's what's available. As we're talking about these longings being satisfied, that is on the table for you. That is available to you. Jesus came here so that that would be possible for you. So if that is where you're at, it's okay. But is this something that you'd like to be a part of. For those of you who uh, already are in in God's family, uh, the question for you is, uh, have you committed yourself to a community? Have you committed to being a part of a church or ministry? And certainly, as we say all the time, we're not saying that that has to be NLCF. There are truly a lot of great churches and ministries right here in Blacksburg. But we can't overstate how important it is for us to jump in with one and really sink our roots down in that community. If we don't, we're missing part of the Lord's provision for us, right? It doesn't mean that, that you know, we're, we're not good with God. It doesn't mean that uh, he's, he's angry with us. It doesn't mean that even he won't speak to us. But we are missing part of his provision for us if we don't really commit ourselves to a community. Now, many of you are uh, are committed to a church or a ministry here. And that's awesome. The question for you is, what would it look like for me to be more fully devoted? What would it look like for me to to be used by God in the ways that we see these people here being used by God? And, And so we've got some challenges for you up here as well. Join an engage group. Again, it is impossible to overstate how important it is. Um, at NLCF, that's the way that we primarily do life together, right? We, it's hard for us to do life with hundreds of people uh, every single week. 
but we can do it with, you know, 10. And that's what we do in our engage groups. That's part of the Lord's provision for us. Serve in our church. Uh, I can tell you that right now we need help with production, lighting, and sound. No experience required. Shameless plug right there. Um, serve in the church. There's other, there are other ways to serve as well. If that's not your, your flavor, uh, go for the hospitality team. Serve on the worship team. Look for the needs of the people around you, right, in, in your engage group, the people that you're sitting next to right now. What might God be calling you to do? How might God be calling you to meet their needs or to challenge or encourage them, right? The Spirit is in us, and he uses us to do these things. Give, right? We see that uh, right in Acts. They're selling their possessions. They're generous with their possessions. Give, it's an important thing. So as we close this morning, I want us to just remember that hope that we have when we read that passage, the excitement that comes up in us. And I want us to know that that can be a reality here. In fact, in many ways, it already is. And uh, I think I have a couple of pictures that I think might demonstrate that pretty well. Um, so we had our fall retreat this weekend, and, and Andrew mentioned this as well. This is from our baptisms yesterday, and we had five people uh, be baptized as, as a part of our family, and um, it was an incredible moment. Honestly, it really was. Uh, it was, the way we do things here at LCF is people um, will stand up and they'll say, this is kind of what God has, has done in my life. This is what's brought me to this moment of, of deciding to follow him in baptism, um, And so these five people stood up in front of us and said, this is my story. These are the mighty works of the Lord in my life. And yes, there were moments of incredible pain in those stories. There was struggle, there was doubt, there was rebellion. But ultimately there was healing and there was victory, right? Even if those things are still in the process of being made whole, It was there. And people started sharing about the things that God had done for them through their brothers and sisters as a part of this church, right? How we had borne their burdens, how we had helped them, how we had encouraged their faith, all of us. And and knowing what we were going to be talking about today, it was truly an astounding moment for me. It was almost like this section that we, we just read in Acts got distilled down into our time, because as they would share these stories, we cheered, we whooped, we hollered. Y'all know what hollering is? We hollered. Um, We did some hollering. We celebrated what God has done. And it was just this moment of saying, yes, God, you do satisfy those two fundamental longings in us. And in part, you do that through this community. When we see something like that, we grab hold of it. And we don't let it go. Let me pray for us. Father, we thank you so much that you satisfy God. We thank you for that truth. And Lord, we know that it's not perfect. We know that it's difficult at times, Lord. But Lord, we know that it is good. And we thank you for that, Lord. We ask, Spirit, that as we receive this good news, we would respond in obedience, that that you would bring things to our mind right now, whether that's serving uh, in the church, whether that's taking care of someone's needs around us, whether that's whatever, God, sinking our roots down into a community. We pray that you would speak and that you would help us to walk in obedience. Pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.